Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are right now in the world. Okay, in an alphabetical order, we have registrants from Australia, Canada, Denmark, Egypt, Germany, Ghana, India, Jamaica, Japan, Malaysia, Nepal, Netherlands, Antilles, Norway, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Qatar, Serbia, Singapore, Spain, UAE, UK, US, and Uganda. Welcome to all of you guys, and I apologize if I missed your country, so please do let us know on Twitter. Okay, my name is Mike Lopez, and I would like to welcome you to Coders Calls webinar number two entitled Basic Web Design Concepts and Your First HTML Web Page. This webinar is being broadcast live via Google Hangouts on Air and is also being recorded for the sake of those who can't come today. Uh, some people may be wondering why YouTube is showing up in the video player if this is live, and that is because Google Hangouts on Air streams live via YouTube and records it at the same time. Okay, those of you, however, who've set aside time to, set, uh, to attend today's event will have the opportunity to join the live Q&A portion later where you can ask your questions and get answers from us. We will be monitoring questions via Twitter, so please follow us on twitter.com slash coderscult. Post your questions with the hashtag PHPTraining so we can easily find them. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Okay, this webinar is sponsored by Wishlist Member, a powerful yet easy to use membership solution that can turn any WordPress blog into a full blown membership site, trusted by over 43,000 online communities and membership sites worldwide. Internet Marketing Inc., a full, a full service digital marketing agency offering SEO, PPC, social media community development and marketing contextual, behavioral, and retargeted display ads, email marketing, and web design and development. Listed on the Inc. 500 list as the 185th fastest growing company in the U.S. And LearnPHP.co, an online video training community for beginner coders that aims to help PHP coders get past the initial learning curve, gain confidence in their ability to master PHP, and give them the roadmap for the rest of their learning journey. Okay, for those of you who are attending this webinar, uh, to sorry, for those of you who are attending this webinar uh, for the first time, allow me to introduce the cult masters, who are yours truly, Mike Lopez, John Morris of LearnPHP.co, and today's main speaker, Bench Ariola. Bench is the SEO director at Internet Marketing Inc. He got into web design and development as a normal transition from desktop publishing back in, well, you know, 1997. His experience in web development predates the existence of many of today's popular open source CMS, and so was one of those who had to actually build CMS from scratch. A former quality analyst slash chemist and chemistry professor, he transitioned into an award-winning web design and developer, and I'd call that a major switch, really. In 2004, Bench started diving into the world of search engine optimization, where he, still, where he still applies his technical knowledge of web development to his advantage. Bench now contributes on several blogs and speaks at e-commerce and SEO conferences internationally. We, however, have a good news and a bad news. Bad news is that Bench is currently at the airport waiting for his flight back to San Diego and is having trouble finding good internet connection. We first thought that he would be able to find good internet connection at the airport, but apparently that is not the case. Good news, however, is that we're used to things breaking down in the world of programming, and so we thought ahead and prepared for the worst case scenario. Meaning, Bench actually took the time to record this lecture while he was still at the hotel, so just in case this thing happens, we can still stream it uh, live today. Okay, here goes. Hi, this is Benj Ariola, and the reason why you're listening to this is probably I was not able to uh, make the webinar on time. Uh, I am currently uh, working remotely. I went to Atlanta, Georgia at Emory University. Uh, to do a lecture on SEO to the School of Business. I supposed to get on this webinar calling from the airport because that uh, I would be at the airport by that time. 
I made this recording just in case I don't make it, I can't find an internet connection, or for whatever problem I just couldn't be online uh, during the webinar. Okay, so uh, I apologize if I was not able to um, be online during this time. I made this recording as a backup plan and uh, hopefully I could use Google Plus on my phone so I could still answer questions live. Uh, if not, I'm sure you're in great hands with Mike Lopez and John Morris who could handle some of these questions. Uh, when the recording is up online and it goes on the blog, uh, where on the site on Coders Cult. Uh, in the comment section, I would also still be answering questions there. I would still be monitoring Twitter, and I could also answer questions there as well. So moving forward, the presentation. Um, these are initial slides. I assume Mike has gone through them. So questions can be posted on Twitter. It's These are our sponsors, Wishlist Member, Internet Marketing Inc., Learn PHP. We are the cult masters, and I assume maybe Mike Lopez has given some introduction about myself. Uh, and what I wanted to say about this is when we're learning PHP, MySQL, CSS, JavaScript, and so on, uh, many people think that, that it should be in a linear process wherein I can't learn CSS if I, if I haven't learn HTML yet. I can't learn JavaScript if I haven't learned HTML and CSS. I can't learn PHP if I haven't learned all the previous three and so on. Now I would say that is partially true. Maybe it maybe that is a good practice. You learn PHP if you learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript first. But that doesn't mean you have to know everything completely in HTML, everything completely in CSS. Uh, even just looking at how the school works, you know, you have multiple subjects. You have English, you have, uh, you have math, you have science, uh, and so on. And let's say you can't read yet. So you can't read a book in math. Does that mean you have to learn how to read completely? Uh, and your, all of your elementary days would be all on reading until you're a professional reader. And then maybe in middle school or high school, then you're going to learn math. It's not really like that. So you could learn things simultaneously. So looking at it, how we plan to do this is more of a combined effort. You see, you're learning HTMLs, the basics, the basics of CSS, the basics of PHP, and then as it progresses, then you'd learn intermediate HTML, intermediate CSS, intermediate PHP, and so on. So as uh, the meetings uh, roll out, from session to session. The first session we had was an um, introduction in how PHP, MySQL, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript kind of interact with each other, how they help each other. And that was uh, first presented by Mike Lopez. And what, what I'm going to present today is more on the basic uh, HTML and CSS, giving a, gi a, a good overview so you could understand that. And then we're going to move from topic to topic and, and let these uh, uh, different sessions uh, help connect the dots in between so you, you could learn uh, PHP in a better way um, by also learning HTML and CSS simultaneously on different sessions. Uh, that way you could learn PHP by starting with no knowledge at all, no web development knowledge at all. So this these sessions are really intended for the newbie that doesn't know anything at all um, on how to build a website. So starting out with my agenda, I'm going to start out with some web design concepts, use conventions, talking about the dimensions of websites, cross-browser compatibility since there's several browsers out there, what are the softwares you generally need when you're able to make a website, and also uh, starting out with the, your first web page that uses HTML and CSS. So going straight to use conventions, what do you see here? These are what? Well, most of you probably know that this is the symbol that they use for power buttons. It is a used convention. Um, ever since uh, the day when this was used as the symbol for power, for the power button, um, all other appliances, since it, there was a wide adoption, people started using this as the symbol too. 
I'm not sure if you're aware of the history of this, but when when the power buttons used to be like a switch um, that you really toggle up and down, um, uh, there's two symbols actually. There's the line and the circle that they're beside each other, and one is for on and one is for off. But for power buttons that you just press and it's the same action for on, it's the same action for off. Um, uh, there's no like a lever type of switch, but it's a button type of switch. This is where they put the line and the circle on top of each other. Okay? So it is a use convention. If you use a different symbol for a power button, it's probably something that people would not recognize. And when they don't recognize, they don't know what the, what the button is is for. They may not recognize that it is a power button. Here's another example of a use convention. Um, in a car, I remember when I was driving my old car, it was a Toyota Corona 1978, I think. It was a very old car. And the signal light was actually on the right and the wipers or on the left it was opposite of many other cars that I have driven and and as years move forward almost every car today the signal light and the light controls are on the left and the wiper controls are on the right so and why why did cars started to to copy each other and and make them all the same way because it is a used convention that people are used to if you switch it they may get confused and uh, users may not appreciate that people like getting used to um, a convention that is used by many people they adopt it and if you stray away from that then you get people complaining here's a common panel also within a car you know, you have the symbols for defrosting, for your air conditioning, uh, for your strength of your cooling. Uh, your radio always has the one, two, three, four, five, six numbers, which is goes way back to old school radios. That is where the radio button term actually came out. Even from HTML, there's a radio button because when you press one, the others go off, and that's exactly how a radio button works you press one station you press the other station the others go off so um, again there are symbols here you see the power symbol you see the aircon symbol you see the defrosting symbol these are used conventions um, uh, users recognize these um, they use it so that uh, people won't get confused okay if you change the convention then it's a whole new learning process and uh, users may not appreciate that so looking at the website it's pretty similar users like to see what they're used to see so on a web page commonly you have a header section on top okay and you have a sidebar now the sidebar is sometimes on the left sometimes it could be on the right Sometimes it could be on both left and right if you have like a three column website instead of a two column website. But for now, let's just consider the left sidebar. Now, most websites also have a footer down below. Okay. And then you have your main content, and that is where the bulk of the content that you normally look at that's where you read, that is where the main content that you're interested in is located at. Now, if you're going to look at your header, that often contains your top bar navigation. It's your high-level navigation. Sometimes there would be some drop-downs for that uh, if you want to drill down into a deeper part of the hierarchy of your site architecture. Also on the header, you have your company logo, uh, and it's often on that position. It's on the left. Okay. Now. On the sidebar, most of the time it's used for secondary navigation. Maybe a search box could be added there. Uh, the secondary navigation is if you click on the link on your top bar navigation, if ever there are sub pages under, under the, the page that you've chosen on your top bar, those are the secondary options. So you could look at, imagine the sitemap of your of your whole website uh, there there there's several layers of links wherein you start with the home page the initial links or the first layer links are on your top bar the links coming from that first layer would be uh, 
placed on that secondary navigation on your sidebar. Now, sometimes the sidebar navigation has more space. And there could be several things that could be added there. You know, there could be ads, there could be promos, there could be contact information, there could be a contact form, there could be client testimonials, and so on. Um, everyone uses it for a different purpose, how the sidebar is used. But normally, it is on a, a more different ways to navigate through your site. Now, on the footer nav in the footer area of your site, uh, normally it has a text bar navigation, and the text is a text equivalent of the top bar navigation. A top bar navigation may look nice and pretty; it could be graphical, could have some drop-down menus, could have some nice color, and so on. The bottom text navigation at the the, the navigation down at the footer is normally just plain text. It's just good usability wherein if someone is using the site, they scroll down the page. Instead of going all the way up to click on a new navigational element, they just know that the text navigation is there also as a second option. Okay. Sometimes people add the address there and just globally across the page. All, all pages, the physical mailing address is also included down below. Sometimes some legal stuff are there, some legal disclaimers, uh, whatever fine print that is also needed, uh, copyright notices, privacy policy links, or links going to um, terps, terms of service and so on. In that main content, often included on the home page, there's what do you have this header graphic and sometimes it's in flash sometimes it's dynamic HTML like it's a image slider or something or some type of slideshow uh, the main purpose of that header graphic is really to to gain attention of, of a person that initially visits your site so in that header graphic since you're gaining attention sometimes there's promos in that in, on that area. Sometimes um, it could be used for stating your unique selling proposition or your USP. Um, sometimes your key differentiators, your competitive advantage, uh, why people should actually buy your product or service. It's usually included in that area. It's your main selling point. It's, it's telling your audience why you rock, why you're awesome, why you're the best. Okay. In your main content area, this is where obviously the content is. And the content, you know, your content could be uh, in different forms. Um, normally there's some text, could be in paragraphs, you could have some headings and subheadings. Uh, occasionally, or maybe all the time, depends on what your site is all about, you could have some images also. Now, aside from your top bar navigation, your sidebar navigation, your footer navigation, uh, it's always good practice to have a breadcrumb navigation. Uh, a breadcrumb navigation is um, it's uh, it's a series of links side by side, often separated by a colon or uh, another character uh, or a less than sign or a greater than sign or a pipe symbol, but it's basically just showing the hierarchy uh, of pages in, re in relation to the page where you are. It's, it, it's a hierarchy, it is, okay, repeat, let me say that again. It is the location of your page in relation to the hierarchy of all other pages on your site. So uh, it's also good for usability because you could land on a page from a different site, from a search result, from a social media site or from a, a totally different uh, partner site and when you land on that page once you see the breadcrumb navigation it get it gives you a good idea where you are within the whole website so users are not really lost they get a good idea that um, they could either go up the hierarchy and find something uh, more general and when they go up they could find other similar pages within that same uh, level and they could drill down in another path. Uh, aside from that, uh, from a search engine perspective, uh, breadcrumb navigation is treated in a specific way that sometimes they appear within search results. Um, uh, the text text navigation also down below the page uh, is sometimes a more search engine friendly way if ever there's too much uh, special effects that you have on the top bar navigation that makes it difficult to crawl by search engines. Okay, so I just wanted to give this common layout um, because if you're going to learn HTML, you're going to learn how to make a website, and this is not really 
a web design class this is not strictly about design and this is not strictly about usability and these sessions are more about coding but um, one thing that I just wanted to share is when you do create websites when you do start coding always consider um, the use conventions uh, things that people are used to because if you stray too far away from it uh, people get lost on the site they don't appreciate it they abandon your site they don't like it and they might go on to your competitor okay it's nice to be creative sometimes and uh, attract attention but it, if it adds on to the confusion and it's something that people are not used to then probably it's not a good idea to go in that direction okay now all the elements that I've added here is pretty comprehensive it does not mean when you make a site all of these should be there uh, some of these are optional it really depends on what you need okay so after talking about these use conventions let's talk about dimensions of a page now as the years has gone by uh, monitors have you know increased in size over the years we really have some big monitors these days and aside from that the resolution has got gotten better too and so you're seeing more uh, clearer uh, images on your monitors because it has more pixels on the screen the resolution is is higher now uh, the ones that I've uh, highlighted there in orange is what I would say are the common resolutions that you see today when you buy a monitor um, or when you buy a laptop or uh, these are the common dimensions or the common resolution settings that uh, you would be able to choose within um, the display settings of your own computer now when I say 4 by 3 that is basically the ratio of the uh, height and width of your monitor 4 by 3 uh, it's often labeled as the standard uh, size uh, these days most monitors are already in the wide uh, the widescreen type of format also for the laptops which is the 16 by 9 we're seeing more more and more of these types of uh, monitors these days the 4 by 3 standard is kind of uh, decreasing over time uh, but the most important thing here is whenever you it, you have to keep this in mind when you make a website because uh, one thing you want to avoid is the side to side scroll bar you just want the up and down scroll bar um, if your website scrolls both left to right and up and down it almost feels like you're looking through uh, a, a page you're looking at a printed page th through a a cardboard toilet paper roll uh, the cardboard of the toilet paper roll where you're looking through it and you're moving the cardboard all over the page through a hole so it's like you're scrolling around just to see the whole page what you you want to avoid the left and right and the up and down scroll bar ideally you only want the up and down scroll bar so having said that and knowing these dimensions it's nice to know the minimum width okay um, Currently, many designers uh, have their minimum width set to around 900 to 1,000 pixels um, because the lowest common resolution these days is either 1024 or 1280. That is like uh, the smallest width. So to maximize the area, to get the largest possible design uh, within that that the largest possible design within the smallest resolution is keeping at it around that that uh, that number of pixels around 1,000 900 to 1,000. Could you make it exact? You like make it exactly at 1024? Maybe make that the the minimum width. You can also, but we're giving some allowance for the scroll bar that appears on the right. Aside from that, sometimes you could have some type of design elements on the borders of your site uh, so the 900 to 1000 is usually uh, a safe resolution to choose as for the height since you could just scroll up and down then um, you don't really pay much attention to to a minimum or maximum height as long as the web page scales meaning it adjusts depending on the contents of your page then um, you're pretty good in, in that area
Now, speaking of width, uh, one thing that I also want to talk about was the fluid and fixed width. Now, when we're comparing the fluid and fixed width, here are screenshots of uh, a website. They're actually the same website, but they have two different settings. There's a setting to make it fluid width and fixed width. So here is a screenshot at this resolution at 1024 by 768. Now here is a screenshot of the same website, but at a higher resolution, the 1600 by 900. And the one on the left that says fluid width, you could see as the width of the browser increase, the width of the website also increase. While on the right, when we say fixed width, the width of the website did not increase when the, the resolution increased. Okay, now the areas on the left and the right generally called white space, but if you're going to look at the color, it's not necessarily colored white, but it's still a general ter terminology for any type of space that is not used, and, and it scales, it's expandable, it's basically a blank area, it's generally called white space. Now, uh, so which one is better? Would you want fluid width or fixed width? It really depends on your purpose or, or how you really want to design your website. So whenever you're going to make a website, you're going to start learning HTML. This is one of the decisions you want to make. Do you want it to be fluid or do you want it to be fixed? Um, there's no uh, good answer of which one is better. It really depends on, on the website's content as well. Um, I could imagine a website that is crowded with too many elements, too many things to choose on a page that looks crowded. Uh, you would normally want that to be fluid because it expands. Um, let's say you have a website that's only two columns or one column. It has lots of text. I would normally keep that with, as a fixed width. And the main reason is if you're reading text, and in your eyes uh, read lines across the monitor from left to right, left to right. If they're too far away, when you finish reading one line and when your eyes go back to the left, it sometimes get, gets lost on what line you're at. That's why newspapers have narrow columns uh, when, because, because users also get, get confused when reading a newspaper where to look at if the, if the column sizes are too wide. Okay, so it really depends. Are you text heavy or do you have so many options? Is it a gallery of photos? Um, there's different uh, things to consider uh, when you're deciding if you want a fluid or fixed width. Now, these days, uh, there are more and more websites that is using responsive design. And when we take about when we talk about responsive design, uh, this is talking about your website actually adjusting depending on uh, the resolution it is on. Okay, so depending on the width, the website could adjust. So you can see here in this example and in, in this illustration, you can see if ever it's on a computer or on a laptop that has a wide screen, um, there's three columns beside each other and when it's in a narrower screen, like on the iPad, you can see that the three columns suddenly turn into three rows uh, where they're stacked up on, upon each other. And if it's on a handheld device, suddenly the image disappears and we just keep it as a text. So that is responsive design. It adjusts depending on where it's uh, viewed on. And there's no redirection to another page or what. It is exactly the same page. It just responds depending on uh, where you're viewing it and what the resolution is. Now here is one example of a website that ha that was that has responsive design. Um, this was made by Internet Marketing Inc. And this is uh, the website of Eve Torres, who is a former or still is, I think, uh, a wrestler, basically a, a woman wrestler, and uh, she's a TV personality, and she's been on that program that you see on the banner. It says "Winner of Stars and Stripes," and so. So what you, what what I have here is a screenshot of the site, uh, on a on a wide screen. Okay, I believe this was by a, on a six sixteen hundred by nine hundred uh, resolution. Now. When the, when you decrease the width of that, you could already see that uh, the white space on both sides uh, no longer appear. But is it only 
uh, having a fixed width and the and the edges are disappearing actually not even the image is adjusting if you could look at the position of the helmet um, uh, it's right below the logo on the wide resolution but when the resolution got smaller you can see the helmet is already kind of beside the logo or the logo is actually the signature of the celebrity now when you make the resolution even smaller suddenly the the masthead area the the head the header area suddenly changes okay um, the social uh, button suddenly gets stacked below the logo and the header graphic also adjusts and it turns uh, it moves down below uh, there's a top bar navigation that disappears but it turns into a button that you could drop down and choose other options if you make the width even smaller like in a in a handheld phone on a smartphone still it's also compatible so this is uh, an example of responsive design um, and this could also be done so it really depends on what you need what you want if you want to go fixed with fluid with or responsive but of course uh, while learning HTML in the very beginning uh, probably the most challenging would be responsive and the easiest to do in the very beginning would be fixed fixed with so but as you get better and better um, these are things that you could play around with okay what is the concept of above the fold when people say above the fold they are really referring to the visible portion of a web page without scrolling down okay um, in the website you really want to gain that first impression you want to keep people on your website and that first impression could make or break uh, a decision of exploring your website more or not uh, so whenever you design a website you always consider what appears above the fold if if there's some good information but people have to scroll down before they see it and some people may not decide to scroll down they might abandon your site just but just because they didn't see the good information that 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 they wanted to see so what you see here in a screenshot is uh, a screenshot from uh, Google Analytics where Google Analytics actually um, has this tool to give you an idea uh, of the different resolution sizes and uh, it lays this out um, into these layers of uh, orange shades wherein the lighter the shade is uh, is the higher the probability of people actually seeing that uh, area above the fold and then the darker the area is um, the probability of someone actually seeing it below the fold so because there's different uh, monitor resolutions um, and and there's uh, and Google has a good idea of of how many people actually have that resolution uh, just by using data from Google Analytics and running uh, statistical uh, uh, calculations from that point um, it comes up with this type of mapping on your site now another tool that you could use just to check how your site looks like uh, there's a website called resizemybrowser.com you could just simply visit that and it already gives you some buttons to simply click on so you could visit any type of site and just click on these buttons so it resizes your page and then visit it uh, resizes your browser and then visit your site again and then from there it gives you a good idea of how your website looks like at these lower resolutions now there are also like uh, other tools like um, the web developer toolbar plugin that you can see here the, um, there's a drop down as on a toolbar menu and there's some options that you could choose your resolution like 800 by 600 1024 by 768 and under the button edit size resize dimensions you could actually add any dimension you want so uh, similarly to resize my browser instead of visiting a site it's already embedded within your toolbar you can simply click the drop down choose the resolution and check how your website looks like now the above the fold concept actually came from newspapers and it was not really it, it was not 
the term was not used initially for websites and the fold is really the fold of the newspaper uh, publishers were considering uh, what is above the fold on the newspaper they wanted the main hi highlights the main news uh, the main reason for someone to actually buy the newspaper or get the newspaper should be there above the fold because on newsstands um, they normally don't see what's below and they make sure that the best news that would compel the user to buy the newspaper is above the fold. And then the terminology was just used for websites as well for the same concept. So whenever you're designing websites, also something you want to consider above the fold. Now, probably some of you have heard about this already, the cross-browser compatibility. There's so many web browsers out there and whenever you design a website sometimes uh, if you're a beginner and you just made the best website and you designed it in uh, Internet Explorer and then you, you really think it was the best and suddenly you view it in Firefox and it's totally messed up or the website just breaks it goes into thousands of pieces and they're all over the place or they're on top of each other uh, the sidebar is hidden or the content is covering the header and so on so there could be some problems uh, between browsers and because the browsers are not really the same they don't run in the exact same way now no, I showed those icons of multiple browsers out there, but probably the ones that you could pay attention to are only these five. Uh, you could see the logo starting with the the blue E, that's Internet Explorer, and going clockwise. There's Opera, there's Firefox, there's Safari, and there's Google Chrome. Um, I would say you could only concentrate on these five and not really pay attention to the rest, because once your website looks good in on these five most probably they already look good on, on the rest as well because the rest are usually just variations of, of these now looking at it in terms of uh, how many people actually use these browsers there's still a large population of people that use uh, Internet Explorer although there's a growing population of people that uh, is using Firefox and also Google Chrome so um, Sometimes it, it, this is really something that you should consider because whenever you make a website, you want it to be visible uh, to everyone, everyone that views your site. And if they can't view your site properly just because they're using a different browser, then you're going to lose people visiting your site. You're going to lose people. You're going to lose traffic going there. Now, the problem is when you design one site on one browser it may not look good on the other and that is because of their differences in in the box model now when we talk about the box model basically any element on your page uh, is like surrounded by a box there's an imaginary box around it there could be a visible border or do, there could be an invisible border but either way how how these browsers define the borders of the box um, are inconsistent. So you can see here um, the Internet Explorer width, how it's explained here, is it considers the border width as part of the total width, while um, in everything else, um, the border width is excluded from uh, the width of the element. So whenever you code something in CSS uh, and is and we'll go more into the code later and you're starting to specify some certain widths that have borders suddenly you view something on IE that looks different on Firefox and Chrome and it's because of this how they treat things now another inconsistency is there's some default values uh, anything any element that you put on a page you put in the image you put in the header you put in a you put in some paragraph uh, if you don't specify any type of margin or padding or you don't specify a border um, uh, uh, all these browsers have different default values they have different default margins default paddings that when you view them they're, they're also inconsistent so um, this could be fixed uh, by setting them all initially to zero uh, instead of um, uh, using the default values alone so here are some best practices and this is not in this is not in any way uh, complete but these are just a few that I could mention right now
First is set all uh, margins, padding, and borders to zero uh, to, to initially uh, create consistency by removing the default values. So if you set everything to zero uh, on almost every element, then you're sure uh, when this is viewed on any browser, they should look exactly the same. Okay. Now, avoid using browsers uh, borders that affect the width or height of elements. You could you could use borders, but you it's uh, ideal not to use borders if they start to push other elements on your page in a different position. Um, that may not sound clear right now, but in the future you, you'll you'll understand that more as as you start working on the specific code. Now avoid using negative margins, paddings, uh, negative margins and negative paddings. Now what I mentioned in these three bullet points, I use the word avoid. I don't say don't, um, because you could still make a website work even though uh, even though you use negative paddings and margins, even if you use borders. Um, avoiding them is just a safer way to make sure that everything's compatible, but. Uh, you'll learn more about this also as we move on to the next sessions. Now, obviously, if you really want to check if your websites look good in different browsers, it's better to install all the different browsers. Um, one thing nice to have is once you have Internet Explorer, there is what they call the developer tools. It's built in with the latest versions of IE. And there's an option there to choose different versions. So you could you could look at your website on Internet Explorer uh, pretending to be an older version of Internet Explorer. Now there are other tools out there and I found this nice blog post on mobilejumbla.com that uh, shows you different tools that you could uh, install on Firefox that could kind of uh, emulate um, uh, a cell phone, a smartphone. So if ever you make a website that um, is is responsive, it has a responsive design, or even if it doesn't have responsive design, you just want to see how your website looks like if ever it was on a mobile phone. This is one of the tools that you could use. The tools are listed on this on this blog post. Now for cross browser testing tools, there are also some tools out there that you could use. Adobe has its own uh, browser labs and um, browsershots.org is probably one of the oldest uh, tools out there where you, you just submit the URL of the page and it's going to take screenshots of your page and, and you can view it in various browsers. So those also help out if you want to test your uh, cross-browser compatibility. So if you're going to make a website, what type of software do you need? Again, this is more of a coding uh, webinar and the sessions that you're gonna learn uh, moving forward are gonna be more about code although when you're making a website it does have some images in there and this is not a graphics type of webinar but uh, if you're new to making websites and you're not really used to make any type of graphic design um, and you're not aware of these softwares so that's just this the purpose of this is just to tell you some of the software that you could use uh, whenever you're building out a website so for your graphics um, you generally classify that as raster or vector um, basically to give I'm going to try to explain this as the simplest way as possible. But when I, when I say raster, uh, your images are in pixels. They're, uh, so you're basically storing different colors of pixels, uh, while a vector is not really colored pixels, but instructions. Uh, mo these are mostly like formulas that, that you don't even see the formula, but they're, they're more of instructions that the um, there are more of the instructions that the uh, that the software saves. So if there's a circle, there's a line, there's a curve, there's a square. Um, that is what um, the software saves. So uh, you could already imagine that vector graphics uh, they're not affected by resolution. You zoom in, you zoom out, it looks exactly the same. For raster images, since they're pixels of information, they're dots of colors uh, that are beside each other. When you zoom in and zoom out, 
that's when they tend to be pixelated. They get blurry or they get clearer depending on <coughs> uh, how far you zoom in or zoom out. Now, I know that uh, Photoshop and Illustrator are also expensive software. Uh, maybe not all of you have this, but if ever you do want one and you're looking for a free option, uh, first is there's other open source software out there like GIMP and uh, I don't know, maybe Blender. And, and then the, these are open source that you could use. But you could also get Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator for free, but it's going to be an older version. It's the CS2 version. When you get a copy of this uh, of this PowerPoint presentation, uh, you could actually click on the link where it says "Get it for free," so you could see where, where to get that CS2 version. Uh, Adobe has given that is giving that away for free, but they also have a disclaimer saying that they're not going to give any support for this software because they have already discontinued it. But based on my experience, CS2 is pretty decent. Uh, version you could already do a lot there on Adobe Photoshop Illustrator and CS2. Now, for actually editing HTML and CSS, there are several softwares out there. Adobe Dreamweaver is probably one that is commonly used. Um, I personally don't use Adobe Dreamweaver. I even use an older version. Uh, I use uh, Adobe Home Site that used to be Macromedia Home Site. That used to be a layer Home Site. It was just a series of of acquisitions from company to company. It turned into Adobe Home Site. But since it's also competing against uh, Dreamweaver, uh, Adobe decided to drop the home site but for me it's still one of my uh, favorite HTML editors. Now Dreamweaver does have a price I haven't found a free option but if you what what else could you do if you want to uh, find an HTML editor for free? Uh, here are se several that are free there's Blue, Griffon, Composer, NetBeans and Aptana. All of these are also links when you do receive this uh, you could click on them it goes straight to the URLs or um, you could simply search these names they're gonna appear up in Google the first one that's it um, most probably you're gonna end up in the right place and you could download these also uh, HTML is really just plain text you could actually type it in in notepad and save the file as um, although uh, you know you're typing everything when you're really using HTML there there's there's some shortcuts in there there's some buttons that you could press some shortcut keys and lots of the code that you would normally would have to type at least uh, it's done in a faster way and there's also some type of debugging tools wherein it would highlight errors uh, almost like how how word does spell check HTML editors does some type of code checking uh, just to see if things are valid or not now uh, some other software that you would probably need whenever you're making a website uh, aside from the browsers are several plugins so I've added some links here the web developer toolbar there's uh, it's gonna add the toolbar uh, on your web browser and this is only for Chrome and Firefox and it has uh, several options to analyze the code on your site um, sometimes if something is not working you could use it as a guide um, or if you're working on a page that you didn't make and you couldn't understand it uh, sometimes uh, there are some tools on the web developer tool that could break the code down uh, highlight certain things uh, add some outlines and uh, it's just easier for you to understand what's happening in the code Firebug is uh, is a developer tool. It goes through. Uh, you could highlight certain areas of of a page, and it goes and it highlights the corresponding code. So uh, uh, it's it speeds up the web development process, especially for finding some type of problems, and the problems in any type in programming and also in HTML is often called bugs. So debugging is finding the problems, and Firebug, that's where the bug comes from, is it helps you find the, find these problems. The Firefox Mobile Developer Tools, this is the same link that, that goes to the blog post that shows uh, tools that you could view your page as if it was a mobile phone within Firefox. Now, Tidy HTML is uh, another plugin that I like using. Uh, HTML... Uh, the main standards are made by the W3 consortium. They set the rules of how a browser should act 
when uh, the specific HTML tags are given. Now, uh, they also have a validator wherein you could run your website and put it in the W3C Consortium uh, HTML validator. And it tells you the errors that appear that it believes that your code is not uh, written properly to the standards that they have set. Tidy HTML is a is a plugin that checks that it checks the rules and and you could already see on your status bar of your browser if there's an error or not. So I like using also that that plugin. So now that we've talked all about that, let's now go into a specific HTML tag. Let's now go into learning HTML itself. Okay. So there are several parts of an HTML tag. Since I'm I'm not doing this live, I feel that I'm speaking too fast. And one thing I like when when I when I'm doing this live, I could pause a bit and I could ask the audience, uh, does everything sound clear? Do you think I'm too fast? then I could adjust my presentation. So again, I apologize, this is a recording. Um, I don't really know if I'm presenting too fast or too slow or, or whatnot, but uh, at least you could still leave your questions on Twitter. I could still answer them at a later time. Um, and if, if you don't get anything now, it should be clearer as, as more sessions pass by and you attend all these other sessions, the next sessions. So in HTML, this is the base language. Uh, all your pages, uh, any web page is really displayed as HTML. And then everything else is just an add-on to that. So what you see here is a, is a common HTML tag, and I'm, I'm just currently breaking it down. So in that very first part is your tag name. And then what you have here is an attribute, and it has a value. Although not all tags have an attribute, and not all attributes have a value. Okay, so some of these are kind of optional, or some of them have multiple attributes. What you see here in the first part of the tag that is enclosed with the angled brackets. When we say angled brackets, that's nothing but the less than and greater than symbols. Okay, uh, what you see there is the opening tag, and then at the end is the closing tag. The closing tag is the same tag name, but it just has a slash uh, right after the first uh, angled bracket. Okay, now all HTML tags are generally in this format. Now there are also tags that don't have closing tags. They're they're just an opening tag and they're somewhat closed just by adding a slash before the closing uh, angled bracket or the uh, greater than symbol. Okay, so if this doesn't sound clear right now, let's just go into examples and it's going to get clearer. The main thing you want to remember is every HTML tag is an opening and closing tag or most of them have an opening closing tag. If they don't, they're close with the slash near the end. They have a tag name, which is basically that element, and these could have uh, attributes, and the attributes may or may not have a value. Okay, so let's go by example, and let's go through eight HTML tags that uh, you're gonna learn today. The very first one is the HTML tag itself. Every HTML uh, page starts with HTML and it closes with slash HTML. Everything in between is all the other tags that you use. Okay, it's just a standard that you put everything within there. Okay, it's almost like telling that this text file is an HTML file. So with this specific uh, text, uh, HTML, opening tag and closing tag, slash HTML, save it in a text file, name it something, just add the .html extension, view it in a browser, and it looks like this. It's a blank because there is really nothing there right now. So let's go on to the next tag, which is the head tag. Now the head, normally what you have in the head section are elements on the page that is not displayed 
on the page itself. Uh, it's more of uh, where assets are, some metadata, and we're going to learn more about that in the, in the following sessions. So looking at this page where you added the head tags, and I took a screenshot and you see there in the browser, again, you see nothing. Now, the next tag, the third tag, is the body tag. Similarly, you see nothing. But most of the things that are displayed on the page, you would see within these body tags. So here is the first tag where you will actually see something. This is a heading tag. It is an H1. When you uh, say an H1, it is the main heading. It is the the highest level within a hierarchy of, of headings. You could have an H2 which has a smaller font size and it and that is a heading, a subheading of H1 and an H3 is a subheading of H2 and so on. Uh, but it only goes up to H6 wherein the font size gets smaller and smaller. So uh, now that we added a H1, how does this look like in a browser screenshot? This is how it looks like. Uh, we write, we wrote "Hello World." I displayed it in the browser, and that's how it looks like. You just see the words "Hello World." Uh, since it's within the H1 tag and it's a heading, normally this text is uh, appearing uh, slightly larger than the text if you didn't have the H1. So here is the next tag where you have here the world is great. Look at this picture. Now, one thing you would notice in this screenshot is uh, the world is great, and you can see that, look at this picture, starts on the second line. But how it's displayed on the page, they're all on one line. That's because uh, multiple spaces and also multiple lines are disregarded uh, in HTML. Uh, if it's written in the code that way, when you view it on the page, these spaces are disregarded and it's treated like a single space. So what you see now is I added the BR tag. The BR tag is a break tag, so it adds like a hard break. So now that I've added the break tag, you could now see how it looks like in the screenshot. There are now two lines because you now told uh, the browser to display the second line on another line just by adding that BR tag. H1 tags normally have a break included with it. Uh, so that's why the world is great doesn't start. Uh, at the end of the H1. Now here's another tag. It's the sixth tag. It is the IMG tag or the image tag. So what you see here is it has one attribute and the attribute is the source or the SRC. Within that SRC, enclosed within uh, quotation marks, you have the URL of the image. Okay, so what does that actually do when you display it? Uh, here is a screenshot where I took a screen, I took the URL of that, I put it in the image tag, and the URL is very large. That's what you see here. It's a large picture. Okay, now on that picture, uh, in a relative size to the hello world, the hello world already looks small just because of that large picture. And I just zoomed out. That's why the Hello World looks even smaller. Now, you can see also uh, right after the URL, uh, there's some white space within the source code. And similarly, within code, if there's uh, some additional spaces there, it's just disregarded. But in this specific example, I added a second attribute to the image tag. And it's a uh, 300. And 300 is actually the width of the image in pixels. So how would this look like after adding that attribute? You see that the image got smaller. But since I kind of zoomed in to the image for the screenshot, it looks like the hello world got, got bigger. But in reality, um, that's just how it's rendered in my presentation. Uh, wherein uh, the image is now smaller in the in, in relative size compared to the to the hello world which is within an h1 tag so another tag is the a tag or the anchor tag okay you can see the text that says this picture is not mine I found it and then there's the a tag 
the a tag has to attribute href. Href is basically uh, the hypertext reference link. Okay, and you can see I have the full URL uh, uh, where the the anchor tag would actually go to if you click on it. And you can see that the opening and closing tag of the anchor tag encloses the word here. And here is the anchor text. That is the actual text that people click on. So how does that look like when it's rendered on your screen? And I just zoomed into the screenshot and you can see here, this picture is not mine. I found it here. And you can see that the word here is underlined because it's a link that you could click on and it's in a different color. And when you click on it, it would go to the URL that I have here. Now, the last tag that I'm going to show you is an HR tag, and the HR tag is simply a horizontal rule. The only thing that it does is it just draws a line horizontally across the page. You can see there that I've added the HR right after the Hello World, and as you see there in the screenshot, there is a line that goes across the whole page. Uh, wherever you apply the HR in, if you apply it within a box, within a table, it's just going to go the full length of that table or of that box or wherever you put the HR in. If you don't put it in anything, then it's going to go across the page from left to right. So those are your first HTML tags, okay? Now, how does it look like in CSS? Now, if you're looking at the code in CSS, uh, this is what you're going to see. You're going to start with your selector, where you're basically selecting where you want to apply your styles. And you have a declaration. The declaration... Uh, is where you set the property and the value. Now you could have uh, multiple declarations for a single selector. Now aside from that, uh, your properties may or may not have uh, multiple values. It depends on the property. Some properties accept multiple values as, instead of just one value. Now if this sounds, uh, if you're already getting confused how this works, let's look at it how it actually looks like within the code. Now using the exact same uh, example that I was using earlier for HTML and slowly adding in, in these links, I have the exact same example but instead of for simplicity purposes the red ellipsis, the dot dot dot, I took out the URLs of the page and, and the image that I, that I had in the previous examples. Let's just assume they're there and I just added in the dot 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 for simplification purposes uh, just for teaching. Okay, now what's different in this code aside from the other examples we've done earlier, within the head section there's now a style tag and the style tag now contains your selector and your declaration. Uh, your selector is H1, your declaration is color is blue. And within that declaration, the property is the color and the value of that property is blue. Okay, so what is this saying? What will appear actually on your site? This is saying that any type of H1 tag that you use within the body, they're all going to be colored blue. Now, in this case, the only H1 you have is the one for Hello World. So the Hello World is actually colored blue. Okay, looks pretty simple. Now, I did say earlier is a selector can have multiple declarations. So here's an example where we added the font size. Let's choose a random number. Let's say a random number of 69 pixels. So how does that actually look like? 69 pixels is larger than it, what it currently was. So what you see now is a larger Hello World text. Okay, so aside from changing the color, we also change the font size. And that is what we normally do within CSS. It's not only for text, but for now, that is what uh, I want you to learn. Basically, just the format of where's the selector, where's the declaration, what is the property, and what is the value. So, where do you actually find CSS code within an HTML document? Uh, here is an example of what we already did in the previous slide. Um, the, the CSS code is located within style tags within the head section. Okay. Uh, now, 
on the set as a second option you could also do this where your CSS uh, styles uh, are actually set as an attribute of an HTML tag so you have the style attribute added to an h1 tag and you can see that the declarations are enclosed within uh, quotation marks or double quotes okay now the third option you have is uh, within the head section is you add uh, an external file that your uh, HTML file is linked to and within that external file is where all your CSS uh, code is so uh, you can see there it has the tag that says link and it, it gives a specific uh, stylesheet file and I just named it stylesheet.css what you see down below is within that file which is just a plain text file you could add the same uh, CSS code you add the, the selector and the declarations and they're all listed in there so even though this is pre-recorded because I couldn't be on the live session I could already imagine maybe some of you are asking when do you use the style when do you use the inline style when do you use external probably the best way to always do it is external okay and the main reason why you would want to do it that way is uh, you could have a single style sheet for multiple pages so whenever you make one change within the style sheet uh, it changes on all pages so it makes things easier to update if you need a global change across a number of pages and it's set up this way then at least it's just one place that you edit and it updates all other pages another thing is when it's an external file um, these files are cached by the browser meaning they're not fetched again from the original source unless it's some X number of days so there's a tendency that your pages are gonna run faster because the the CSS file is cached it's no longer fetched online then uh, aside from that happening to browsers it also happens to search engine bots uh, search engine bots are basically programs that uh, uh, reads pages uh, of websites and follows links and if you take out the CSS file the CSS code and put in an external file these are no longer fetched by the web browser and it makes your pages load faster and faster loading pages are are is also a ranking factor it helps out uh, ranking in websites now uh, if you're going to look at the advantage of the style tags and the inline styles, uh, the style tags, um, you could declare a specific uh, selector and it's going to appear across the board on that single page. So uh, in my example, I have H1. So if you have multiple H1s on that page, the the uh, declaration that you have for that selector is going to apply for that single page from top to bottom while when you do inline styles then that's only styles that apply for the specific tag where you included it okay hopefully that makes sense if not feel free to ask questions and uh, most probably you would get an answer already from Mike or John and if they can't or if they if if um, they just looked over and didn't see uh, you asked that question on Twitter uh, we're st I'm still gonna go back to it uh, later on uh, once I'm back in San Diego so that ends this session already um, hopefully you learned something from there uh, and, uh, these first initial sessions is more of just understanding the standards and uh, getting your feet wet by understanding these initial parts of the uh, HTML and CSS later on in the next sessions it's gonna progressively uh, get more advanced uh, as you learn more and more so again follow us at Coders Cult so the next schedules that are coming up on March 8 the recording of this session would be online uh, and then the next webinar would be on March 15 uh, if it's gonna be in PHP or whatnot maybe most probably it might be uh, my Clopis again and the session after that might be plain HTML it might be me again as it uh, progresses and becomes more advanced uh, 
if we go more into CMSs also later on, then uh, maybe we'd also have John also on the call. So, to access all the previous recordings as well as this, uh, and if you want to register for the next one, you can simply go to coderscope.com slash webinars. Everything you need should be there. Again, these trainings are sponsored by Wishlist Member, Internet Marketing Inc., and LearnPHP.co. That currently uh, ends my presentation. And um, if you need anything else, uh, all the questions will be handled by whoever's on the team. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. All right. Thank you very much to Bench for doing that recording. Uh, we do understand that it's kind of tough right now for him to do all the things that he needs to do, considering that. He's at the airport, and I think he's already boarding on the plane right now. We don't have a good internet connection at the airport as well. So um, uh, looking at the questions right now, I'm not seeing any questions at all. So either Ben's um, presentation was so clear, or <laughs> <laughs> you guys just you know just uh, don't have any questions at the moment. So uh, instead of um, looking at the questions, but we still encourage you uh, guys to post your questions online. Uh, but to those who are still listening, I think John and I will just um, try to come up with uh, some questions just to make some clarification. So John, do you have anything in your mind right now? Well, I was just sitting here thinking that I, I think it's pretty interesting because I think when uh, people see the title for this and maybe even watch the first few minutes, they might have the tendency to think, oh, you know, I already know all this stuff. They might underestimate what's actually in here. But by the time you get all the way through it, Bench is very uh, uh, clear and very specific about everything. And there's really some great stuff in here. Um, there's, there's things in here that I appreciate having gone through. Uh, this is something that, I mean, looking back, I wish I had, ha I had had something like this because it really gives you a good broad overview of all of the things that you have to think about when it comes to designing a page. I mean, someone might say that, you know, oh, I, I, know how to, I already know how to write a web page. But is that, is that really true? Do you, do you know how to write a, again, yeah, we can all come up with the, the HTML tags, most of us can, but can you do it where it's, you know, cross compatible? Can you do it where it's responsive? Can you do it where you're, do you know how to do uh, conditional statements for Internet Explorer if you have to? Do you know how to do CSS resets? You know how to do all of those things that, at the end of the day, as web developers, we create web pages. So uh, do we really know all of those things? And there are some things in there that really uh, reminded me of some things that sometimes I take for granted. I think one of the things, to be specific, that stuck out to me was the CSS selectors. Because I know uh, a little while or a few years back, I kind of had reached a point where I felt like I really had CSS down and I understood CSS. And then I started to learn jQuery. And just Ben's pointing out the, the difference between a selector, a uh, declaration, a property, and a value. Because at that time, I didn't know, I didn't even just know those names. But when you get into jQuery, that becomes very important because you, you use CS selectors very heavily uh, when you're using jQuery. So, I mean, that was one of the things that, that really stuck out to me. Some of the stuff that he talked about. Uh, in terms of the responsive stuff, I thought was great. So, um, I think some of the the question thing is the fact that he was very thorough uh, and, <laughs> and got into it. I mean, I'm, I I was sitting there thinking of, you know, what question could I have? And when it comes to this kind of stuff, I, I mean, he really covered it really well. So I, I thought he did a great job with it. Yep. Um, well, I have to say that uh, ever since I got to know Bench and we were working together doing some PHP websites and stuff like that, he is, as he said, pretty thorough in terms of things like that. And at the moment he got into search engine optimization, he got even more thorough because now he wants to please both people and the search engines as well. Um, yeah. One thing that I also want to clarify, and not necessarily clarify, but just uh, point out uh, on Bench's presentation uh, earlier are... Um, pretty much the importance of following st standards. Uh, not, not on the code while he was doing the actual coding, but prior to that when he was showing us you know, uh, what people expect when they visit your website. 
So some people, there, when people usually, just, as John said, it's easy to create your web page. It's easy to come up with a website. But sometimes you just come up with a website that people just have no idea what to do when they get on that website. And um, a bench, uh, I would say, really made a good point there, saying that if you are going to create something, do it in a way that uh, people expect it to be. Like, like his, he, ha he made a good example with a car. You expect things to be there, like the buttons on the radio, um, where the lever should be, and things like that. And when you move from one car to another, it's going to be the same. And the same is true for websites. Um, a sidebar is pretty much standard nowadays in uh, most websites, except for you know home pages that have to point out some something to you know just for you to focus on, headers, mm -hmm. um, things like that. So uh, it's very very important, I would say, to to go along with standards in terms of that. Um, hmm. So, uh, do we still um, have no questions at the moment? Um, yeah, I do see, see that we have a bunch of viewers, but uh, we're still not having questions. I probably, you are right there, John. That uh, <laughs> bench was pretty thorough in terms of yeah. <laughs> his uh, presentation right there. Yeah. Well, that's, hey, that's fine. It is what it is. You know? Yeah, that is true. That is true. I would say though that it is still. A uh, good presentation, and uh, I would still say that we both have some really good questions between the two of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. is there is there anything else, dude, that you want to add before we uh, wrap up the webinar? No, I would just say anybody who's listening or might watch the replay, go back, keep this this video on file, because I imagine you'll come back and reference this several different times. You might not think it when you see the title or in the first few minutes. Because it seems like stuff that you, you probably think you already know, but by the time you get to the end of it, uh, there's a lot of stuff in there that is, I mean, it's ultimately that's what we do. What he just described is all the things that we have to think about as developers and all the things that we have to do. So uh, I would just say don't, don't underestimate this. Keep it on file somewhere if you can and, and be ready to come back to it uh, again and again. So. As much as we'd like to answer more questions, we all do have other things to do. A friendly reminder, though, is not to, it's not for you to forget us. Okay, let me repeat that. A friendly reminder, don't forget to follow us on twitter.com slash coderscult and get quick updates whenever we have something new to share with you guys. We are also always monitoring the hashtag PHP training so you can continue asking your questions there. As mentioned earlier, this webinar is being recorded and will go live next week, exactly seven days from now on March 8 or 9, depending on where you are in the world. The URL of the recording will be emailed to all of our mailing list subscribers. So if you are registered to any of our webinars, then you're good to go. The next live webinar, on the other hand, will go on air two weeks from now on March 15. March 15 and yes, we will send you guys a reminder about that as well. Once again, we would like to thank our sponsors, Wishlist Member, Internet Marketing Inc., and LearnPHP.co, without whom this webinar would not be made possible. So there you go, guys. Thank you very much for making this webinar a success. Bye for now.